Well, we always appreciate all our praise team members. For the last two weeks, I appreciate it, especially Jared and Shannon leading for us. Matt is out of town today with some of our folks doing a mission effort in El Paso for Afghanistan and refugees. And uh, but Jared and Shannon are the closest things that probably Rebecca and I have to uh, kids that are not our own. We've literally seen them grow up. There's a lot of time at home. And uh, I kind of appointed myself. You guys don't know this, but to be your godfather. <laughs> and nobody has ever asked me to be a godfather. And I think I know why, because I'm not Italian. And it's other than that, we're going to keep our head off. But anyway, never mind. I'm not Italian, so I feel crazy. But anyway, so glad to be back. And uh, you cannot believe how a pastor misses this church, even in one way. It's, it's just amazing. But, uh, you know, I know today we have a spring break and uh, uh, the end of uh, our time change. We're missing a ton of our folks. But everybody here, I mentioned out front, but everybody here today does get a gold star in heaven. And uh, God takes to the people that come on time change and spring break weekly. All right, well, normally we are in our series on Luke, and uh, we're not today. Um, I had the, uh, as Karen would tell you, Luke. Karen, there's a, I already have the, the PowerPoint presentation and everything, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. See? Had it all ready, ready to go, and then um, we, uh, we heard in Colorado um, uh, that uh, there was going to be a memorial service yesterday for a Clinton party, and my heart was really turned for him and his family. And um, the Lord has changed my, my heart on the direction to go today is a one Sunday parenthetical. So um, I want you to think for a second what four words? Or on our points. If I say that out loud, you guys are just, and you guys are good. We're going to talk about trusting God today. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a, an example of that. When we had to fly out of Colorado on Wednesday night late, it was up like 9 30 or even later than I can't remember, but it was snowing. The wind was blowing at 35 to 50 miles an hour. And uh, <laughs> I was, I, I, Rebecca, I, I called the airport a couple hours in advance and said, Planes going to be flying out tonight? They said, Yeah, it's uh, sketchy, but we'll get you up. <laughs> Thank you. I have encouraged. So we're getting on the plane, and the people that are going in that, uh, was it the causeway or wherever that's called, the runway, the, not the runway, that's the key you get run over, but the little hallway leading to the plane, it's so cold. They're bumming up with jackets, and Rebecca would tell you, they're literally shaking like this, just, just cold. And I thought, if I'm going to die in a plane crash, I'm going to be comfortable. So I was in my short sleeve shirt, and everybody's like dressed for like Eskimos. We get on the plane, and we got the exit row, and you could look out, and you could see the wings moving and everything. And boy, I looked around, and there are people chewing their fingernails. They're, they're, I mean, it was, you could see the worry. And um, for a Christian, um, I, I, I can honestly say I, there was no fear in my heart. I, I'm ready to go whenever the Lord calls me, I'm ready. I, there's not one thing I have to say to anybody. I, I think I've done everything I need to do. And, um, but I, I will not lie, when that plane started going down the runway, I thought, is this it? Is this it? <laughs> and we finally got home, and I think it was like, 1.30 or something like that, we, we settled down a little after 2 o'clock and we thought, well, that was interesting. And that further confirmed to me the, the, the aspect of trusting God because I thought there are people right now that are scared to death on this plane because they don't know what's going to happen if this thing were to skid off the runway and crash or in the air and whatever. And um, so I did some research about the in God we trust, in God we trust, in God we trust. Um, back in uh, 1861, November 20th, the Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon Chase, uh, instructed James Pollock, who headed up the Philadelphia Mint, which was the main mint at that time, um, with this, with this uh, edict, quote, no nation can be strong 
or safe except by God's defense. The trust of our people to God should be declared on our national coins. And it took Congress about two years to get that enacted. And in 1863, we started stamping in God we trust on our coins. Um, do you think our nation trusts in God? <laughs> I, I, I can't. I think that's something that's, that most people look at that and they, why is that there? Why is that there? And yet, trust in God is the most basic element against fear, against despair, against hopelessness. And um, I think this, this will be a, a study today that has some Velcro for you. I think this is one you'll be able to say, I need to take some of these points home with me. Um, you know, I was thinking this past week about um, it seems that COVID is kind of coming to an end. And I did a, a retrospective in my head. One day I just sat there for a while in my recliner home, didn't have the TV on or anything. And I was just thinking everything that I could remember from the last two years. I remember during the end of the football season in 19, 2019, they were talking about it. And by 2020, it was starting to become a big deal. And then by March, it closed down. And then the next thing you know, we couldn't have people in the services here. And it was George and Matt and I, and I think Jim a lot of the time. That's it. I mean, nobody here. We had paper plates with faces drawn on them in the chairs. And man, that, that seemed so long ago. But yet it's very fresh and indelible in my memory. And then the, the, it seemed to be going up, and then it'd go down, and then up, and then down, and then you need a vaccine, then you need a second, then a third, then a fourth, and I've lost track how many we're up to now. And um, all the different experts I've seen on TV getting up there and talking about this and that, this and that. And now it seems to be finally uh, going away. And I think of my own experience being in the hospital trying to, to breathe and hypoxia and all that kind of stuff. And I, it, it, I've just seen sometimes despair and hopelessness like I've never seen around our country. I can understand it in Ukraine, but here in the United States, people in despair because they can't find groceries. First off, sometimes you couldn't even find gas. And then when, now when you find it, it's four bucks a gallon. Guess what you're getting for Christmas? Two gallons of gas. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just, there's just a sense of despair. But things are just really rough in the world. And we've already talked about this. Several weeks ago, we did a series, two weeks on uh, Satan. And we talked about how the Bible says in many places, this is, God's, this is, this is not God's home field. He has delegated this to Satan. The Bible calls him the prince of the power of, this, uh, of the air, the ruler of darkness. And, and, uh, and then I gave you the scriptures that Satan is, he's not all powerful, but he is, he's got abilities. In John 10.10, 10, it says, and the thief, talking about Satan, cometh not except to steal, kill, and destroy. That, that's his job description. That's what's, that's what's on his resume if you're going to hire him. I'm very good at destroying lives. And there's a part of um, trusting that I think is the spiritual vaccine toward despair. You know, there's a verse in Psalm chapter 20, verse 7. It says, some trust, and now you got to remember this was written in Bible days. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. In those days, horses would be army tanks, chariots could be airplanes. Those were symbols of advantages in battle. And they said, some people trust in this, some people trust, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Do we really? Do we really? Rebecca gave me a, a letter from Josh today. It was from 2012. You probably don't remember the letter, but it was um, a really neat letter. And Josh wrote one to Rebecca and one to me why he was glad that I'm his dad and she's his mom. And um, 
it, it really was interesting because his perspective was um, the Bible's really always been our guide at home. And thanks, Mom and Dad, for living that out for us. Not just on Sunday, but you lived it at home and that we have learned to trust God's word. So I want to give you just three. There's, there's probably eight or ten Bible verses that I think are my pillars. They're my Ebenezer that I've driven into the ground and say, look, if I ever thought about becoming more casual about the things of God or, or sliding back, I need to have some anchors that are really important to me. And I just picked out three of them for this week. And so let me just give you these. Romans 8, 28, very common verse. And it's that, and we know that all things work together for the good of them who love God and are called according to his purpose. That tells me that circumstances are only temporary, that I don't have to worry about. In the end, God has the scoreboard, and he says, one way or another, you're going to win. Now, that might be after your death, and that's why Paul wrote, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. But in my life, I've always felt like if I love God and I, I live according to his purpose, I can't lose. Secondly, Psalm 115, verse 3, it says, but our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that God does whatever he wants, and what he wants is what glorifies him. One of the things I pray every Sunday right there before the choir, or the music over, I say, God, this is your sermon. It's not mine. You shut my mouth on the things that are about me, and you open my mouth on the things that glorify you, and it's all for you, unto you, by you, through you. It's yours. I've never felt any pressure as far as preaching because it's God has led me on my studies, and when I get up here, I felt like I'm doing what he's, he's guided me to do. So that's the second pillar. The third pillar would be Psalm or Acts chapter 17, verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. Um, that to me is everybody has a, a compass in your life, something that directs your life, something that guides you to your life choices. How am I going to live my life? My compass has been Acts 17, 26. For in him we live and move and have our very being. But my, it, I may be living the life, but it's the life that he wants me to live for him. So those are three of the verses. When I say, I trust God, those are some of the verses that say, this is how you do that, Chuck. This is how you do that. You know, this right now is my favorite month of the year. Maybe tied with Christmas. But you know what happens during the month of March? Anybody? Who said that? I can't believe Bobby, the guy that just jumps on horses, knows what March Madness is. But you're right, Bobby. March Madness. And for, I guess for so our kids were little, every year we get our kids together and sometimes other people, and we'd fill out our brackets. Who's going to win the national championship? And, and, and then you look and you see the scores and who won and who advances. And here's how I think about that. God is, is intentional. He's not filling out a bracket in heaven for, not March Madness, Mankind Madness. Mankind Madness and seeing what decisions are you going to make and do you survive in advance? He's not rolling dice saying, man, I hope Jonathan Klein gets this right. Come on, Jonathan, give me, here's some good luck. That's not how God works. So I have today four ways that you can honestly determine if you're really trusting God. Because I know if I said, are you trusting God? I think every single hand would go up. But I don't know if we're always honest with each other, with ourselves. So here are four ways I think you can determine if you're trusting God. Evidence of your trust will show in the way 
you wait. By the way, I, I did not have time to do a PowerPoint this week. It's the first time in what, two years or something like that? Or a long time? Because this was late breaking news to change the topic. So normally they have the outline up there, but now you've got to take notes yourself. Evidence of your trust will show in the way you wait. On each one of these four, we're going to be in Psalm 119, all in the same chapter. So if you're in Psalm 119, you'll be able to see the uh, core verses for this outline. I'll, I'll be using some other verses, but the main ones will be out of Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 43. And do not take the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I wait for your ordinances. Once again, I sat in the airport that night when the wind was blowing, the snow was blowing, Rebecca went to get something to eat. There was a lady on one side of me, a guy to the other, and I heard the phone conversations they were both having. Oh, no, you should see the weather outside. Oh, no, you should see the... I, I, do you think I should come back and we'll fly out tomorrow? And, and I heard the great concern of these lives. People so concerned. Psalm 40, verse 31 says this. They that wait... We're talking about waiting, right? If you're trusting God, it'll show in the way you wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength... They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The Bible says when you're waiting on the Lord, you're doing something good. It's something that has merit. You know, I have told Matt so many times that my weakest area is waiting. I am, patience is just, that is my Achilles heel. And Rebecca, she's over here laughing. She knows, because we'll go to a restaurant, and they said it's a five-minute wait. We'll drive to Hondo, so we just don't have to wait. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't like waiting. And yet you go to a hospital, and what do they call the room when you're uh, not yet being seen? What do they call that? Is there a worse name on earth? The waiting room. That, I think that's what they have in hell. <laughs> it's a waiting room, except, except a very uncomfortable one. But you know what? This is the truth. You go to the hospital and you wait. Why? Because you're waiting with a purpose. You know, eventually, you will get to see a doctor or a nurse or some, a medical practitioner. And so you wait and you wait with a purpose. Do we do the same thing with God? Do we pray for something and it doesn't happen immediately? What is your response? Remember my last sermon from two weeks ago about the guy knocking on the door at midnight saying, I want bread? And the guy says, no, I can't get up. My kids are sleeping. The door is locked. Go away. And what does the guy do at the door? He keeps knocking and knocking and knocking. And then the, Jesus said in his story, though the man will not get up because he's his friend and his neighbor, He'll get up because of his shameless, relentless knocking. And Jesus told that story to say, that's how you pray. That you don't give up. You keep waiting on the Lord. Waiting time is not wasting time. There was a, a Christian group in the 70s and 80s, I guess they're long retired now, named Petra. Maybe, maybe you've heard of those guys. They had, they had a a song lyric one time, and it's probably one of my favorite lyrics of, that's not scripture. They say, uh, good things come to those who wait, but not, the, not to those who hesitate. So hurry up and wait upon the Lord. Now think about that. Good things come to those who wait, but not to those who hesitate. So hurry up and wait upon the Lord. So I encourage you. If you're willing to say, I'm trusting God, then that'll be evidenced by the way you wait. The second, the evidence of your trust will show in the way you walk. Psalm 119, verse 44 and 45. So I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek 
your precepts. And precepts is another word for truth in scripture. At the end of the uh, memorial service yesterday, I uh, read the 23rd Psalm. And right there in the 23rd Psalm, David, who was running for his life, often, 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 either from Saul or the Philistines or other people that hated his own son. Absalom was trying to kill him. David had all these people always trying to kill him. And I think that's one reason that he was so humble. And that's why he could praise the Lord like he did, because he, he said, man, I don't have... I don't have resources. Right now, I just, I have to trust the Lord. So my trust is going to show in the way I walk. And that means the way I live my life. And, and David said about walking, yea, though I walk through what? The valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God makes the, the evil people go away? It doesn't say that. It says, uh, because you're, God's going to give me a, an alternative route, and I'm going to go around them. He doesn't say that. It, it says this, though. I, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Say it out loud. For thou art with me. See, so many times we pray, we, we want a problem to go away. David didn't pray for the problem to go away. Paul didn't pray for... for God, I'm, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep praying for you make this thorn in the flesh go away. After three times, he says, wait a minute, maybe, maybe God wants me to have that. Maybe he's going to make me strong in my weakness. So when you, in your walk, you have to remember that there, we, have, we have to keep going where God leads us. You know, there's a term in science. You'll probably remember this from school, inertia. What does that mean? That means a, a, a stationary object tends to remain stationary and a moving object tends to be moving. And here's an example. You get, out of your, you get out of here in the parking lot, and you pull out on the street, and you say, hey, let's go to Alamo Cafe and catch up with the McGuire's, and we'll go, go eat at Alamo Cafe. So you hit the gas, and you, and you really start flying down there. You want to catch up with them. And all of a sudden, you see a police officer right there at uh, Mr. Gaddy's, or whatever that is now. And, and so what do you do? You quick hit the brakes. And what happens to your body when you're going fast and you hit the brakes. Your moving body wants to keep moving. So when you hit the brakes, your body goes because a moving object tends to remain moving. But then you see he's writing somebody else a ticket and you say, we're safe. So you hit the gas and then what happens to your body? It sags back because a stationary object tends to remain stationary. And let me tell you this, one of the things I've learned from my Christian life is when you have spiritual inertia, you tend to keep going. There's a statistic that I've heard at church conferences my entire life in ministry that says 20% of the people in your church do what? Anybody ever heard of it? 80% of the, the ministry work. 20% do it. And I'd say that's pretty accurate. You look around any church, this one or other ones, you'll see the same people on the praise team or leading Awana or doing the nursery. And they're the ones that are faithfully going to do it, and they're the ones that say, hey, I need help, I need help, I need help. Because stationary objects tend to remain stationary, and moving objects keep wanting them to move and minister. Have you ever seen those little balls that hang down? There's like five or six of them, and you pull one out, and what happens? You let it go, and it makes them all move, and then it'll just keep going. That's because you've, maybe you've enacted inertia, the stationary and then the movement. I would encourage you, we're only in the beginning of March. Take this year and just try, just try to take up your cross and follow Jesus where he's leading. And I'll bet you if you said, Lord, what would you have me to do? He could point out something to do in this church where you could strengthen the body and you could develop your own spiritual inertia and you get it going. The third evidence of your trusting God beyond your weight, well, beyond your weight and your what? what? Walk. walk. I'm just making the same way. Your weight and your walk is evidence of your trust will show in the way you witness. You witness. Psalm 119, verse 46. For I will speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be ashamed. You know, so much of the Bible, 
the people that we think are great heroes were people fearless with their faith. We love stories of Daniel in the lion's den, David before Goliath, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. We loved how Paul could be beaten and rocked and stoned and whipped and imprisoned, and he just kept going. We think of Joseph uh, in, in Pharaoh's house. We think of Esther when uh, her whole family is being threatened with death. We think of uh, Nehemiah being uh, uh, opposed and still building. Every guy in the Bible, man or woman, that we respect is somebody that were fearless in their faith because they were willing to witness. You know, 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So if he hasn't given us the spirit of fear, what has he given us? But God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That's what God gives you. If you're saying, I don't feel qualified to, to do something in the church. I don't feel able. He's not buying that. Just might as well be honest and say, I don't want to do it. It's not, that you're, it's not a, a thing of being able. It's a, being, a situation of being willing. How is your witness? When was the last time we talked to somebody about, hey, can I... I, know, I don't know if you have your own church, but can I invite you to mine? Something that simple. Have you ever shared your testimony with another person? See, these are fundamental things. These are things that Christians ought to be doing naturally. There's no program. There's no, there's no uh, Southern Baptist or, or whatever, no publication saying, hey, you need to be, go out and, and witness. Because that's what Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. What does Acts 1 8 say? But you shall receive power, and after that you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. The Bible says it's expected. It's expected that we be a witness. But we're sitting there, and we, we haven't had that vaccine of trust in God, and we're fearful. But what does Romans 1 16 say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Just try it this week. Just, just take, take the Bible at its word. Go up to somebody this week. Somebody, well, I was going to say at work, but probably 90% of people are working from home. I don't know. But if you ever go to work or find a neighbor or somebody, just say, hey, look, if you don't have a church, can I invite you to mine? How long does it say? To, that's one sentence. I bet you can say it in three seconds. Three seconds. Just try it. Let's say it out loud. I don't know if you have a church, but I want, you to, I want to invite you to mine. Let's try it. I don't know if you have a church, but I want to invite you to mine. One more time. This time say it with a little oom to it. I don't know if you have a church, but I want to invite you to mine. And I go to 1000 Oaks Bible Church. That, see, there's people like when they, the athletes, when they get to say what college they're from, they'll say, I'm from the Ohio State. So we can start changing it and say, say I go to Thousand Oaks. We just go, I go to 1,000 Oaks Bible Church. Doesn't that sound really impressive? No, don't worry about it, because we're not trying to impress anybody. Acts 13, 22. That's when the Bible says, and David was a man after God's own heart. You know why that, I think that that's, why David's a man after God's own heart. Well, I forgot to give you the, the, op the opening. I'm, my fault. This is the fourth, the fourth W. Evidence of your trust will show in the way you worship. Evidence of your trust will show in the way you worship. And we'll get to David in one second. Psalm 119, verse 47. I shall delight in your commandments, which I love, which I love. And I shall lift up my hands to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. David was a man after God's own heart. And it's not because he lived a wonderful life. David was a sinner. He committed adultery. He was prideful. He could, he could do things his own way in his own time. So David didn't live a, a spotless life. David lived a life like we do. 
Peter was a sinner. He denied the Lord. He was impetuous. He had a temper. He could be uh, prideful also. And yet, Peter's a hero. Elijah, one of my three favorite people in the whole Bible, and I will probably study right after we finish Luke. Elijah could be called down fire from heaven. Yes, amen. But he could call down fire from heaven. And what are we doing? Man, we've got to, to, if we say we believe these things, we need to do them. I am so glad I, that on Sundays I get to come and here, sit on the front row, and I don't try to sing because I can't. I, I'll sing a little bit, but most of the time I, I listen to y'all. And even today with so many people gone, you guys, it sounded so good. And when Jared and Shannon did that acapella stuff and everything, that was really good, you guys. Really good. Jared, I didn't know you could do that, man. That was really good. <laughs> Don't you love to worship? Do you? Because I think we, it should be something that it's happened in our heart before it happens in our mouth. And I've always said my definition of, of, of responding to worship is let awe hit your jaw. Just start thinking about the holy, holy, holy and, and what that's like in heaven. Next week, that, that, that could be the song we'd sing because it's about Jesus doing dishes and washing hands. And all that's about holiness. Let's think about our conclusion here. You don't have to choose to have storm clouds come to you. They're going to come automatically. I've said that from a long, long time ago. My, the pastor that led me to the Lord and did Rebecca and I's wedding used to preach, and he'd say that one phrase more often than anything else, storm clouds are coming to your house. I've adopted it because it's true. Over 40, 45, 47 years, I haven't counted, but what I've been in the ministry is I, I can tell you for sure storm clouds will come to your house. It could be physical illness, it could be financial, it could be relationships, it could be anything. So you don't have the option of saying, I want storm clouds. You do have the option of saying, I will respond to them. I will trust in God. I've heard it said that trusting God is like taking a blank piece of paper and you sign your name on the bottom, a contract, and the only thing is blank and you sign your name and then you give it to God and say, you fill in the rest. That's trusting God, where you say, the decisions are yours, you just lead me by your Holy Spirit. Somebody may say, well, I've, I've, there have been times that I haven't seen God work in my life. And I would say to that, how many of those times did you really commit completely your trust to him? Or did you just give him your expectations? Two different things. Your expectations and your trust are not two. Expectations are saying, I need this, I need this. And your, your trust is the blank page. God, whatever you need to do, whatever. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So what, therefore, whatsoever you eat or drink or do, what? Do it all for the glory of God. It's not about us. It's not. It's about him. I'll close with this very familiar passage. I love it. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time today. Lord, I pray you would put Velcro on your word today, that we would go out of this room saying, I, I am going to be intentional. I'm going to be specific about the way I trust you. 
Lord, I pray folks this week will literally take up the, our trust and they'll show in the way they witness that we will have people here invite people to church, maybe share their testimony with. Lord, everything we do here is for you and we love you and, and it's yours to do whatever you want with. Just be glorified by it. In your precious name we pray, in the name of Jesus, amen.